Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for having me as a, as a speaker. Uh, it's an honor to share a little bit with you about our perspective in emergency medicine, uh, about radiology, and, uh, and how, you, um, how you approach the clinical situations in emergency medicine. So we'll talk about case situations and uh, how to do your best in doing no harm. Basically, we'll talk about how to know the risks involved with the radiology scans that you're going to order, and what to order in specific situations so that you're maximizing the benefit and minimizing those risks. Uh, I would encourage you guys, actually, during the lecture, go to mdcalc.com. I have no uh, financial interest in the website, but it has a lot of good things you can look up that help to augment your thinking about radiology. A friend of mine, I'll you know, admit, is the guy who started that website, but it's fantastic, and I use it myself. Uh, so ground rules. Ground rules in medicine, first rule is do no harm, right? Fantastic. So let's do no harm. So, so how can imaging hurt patients, right? There's different ways. Uh, X-ray and CAT scan radiation is associated with an increase in risk of cancer and death that can be caused by that. Very small risk, but it's real. IV contrast sometimes causes kidney failure and death. CT with IV contrast is more risky than an MRI with IV contrast. And when you send a patient out of a department, out of the emergency department for imaging, that can be risky too. So you have to sort of know these risks and then image when the benefit exceeds the risk. So what type of imaging can you always do? What can you guys think of? Imaging that's pretty much safe in everybody. Basic x-rays, that's right. Anything else? Ultrasound. Oh, you guys are great. Did you see this already? Fantastic. It's almost like you're at the end of the day where you've been learning about radiology the whole time. That's great. It's better than speaking right after lunch, though. So imaging you usually can't do. CT with IV contrast and what type of patients? Renal patients, specifically those that have some failure but are not on dialysis. You kind of want to avoid doing it in most cases because the benefit's probably less than the risk. Why don't we use it on patients who've got chronic kidney disease? Exactly. You can hurt the kidneys worse uh, in any patient, actually, and especially those that have chronic kidney disease, 20% of patients in our best studies, which aren't great, admittedly, show you get some temporary renal failure when you get the CT with IV contrast, and one in 300 patients actually die of when you get a CTA or a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast, but it's probably 10 to 20 years down the road. So these are sort of things we have to think about. They die of renal failure, not of, not of cancer, actually. Um, in deciding if we're going to need to get that CAT scan or not. And the pre and post medications don't really seem to protect the kidneys, even though we wish that they did in the clinical trials that were done. So, CT imaging that you can usually do, right? CT with no contrast and CT with IV contrast in what type of patients? If there's normal kidney function, you could probably do it if you think you're looking for something that's important enough. And if it's end-stage renal disease, their kidneys are already shot. The IV contrast risk is pretty low, as long as they're not fluid overloaded. Just make sure they get dialysis after CAT scan. So that, those two ends of the kidney spectrum are where we do a lot of the CTs with IV contrast, where the benefit is more than the risk. All right. Uh, what about MRI image, imaging you can't do? We, we can't do it if the patient has paramagnetic metal, which is a fancy word for the type of metal that the magnets can pull on, right? Do we see some types of things here that we would not want to send into an MRI scanner? That's great. Yeah, so one person met a surgeon who put a pacemaker in there, and somebody else met a hoodlum who put some pellets from a shotgun into them. So neither one of these people should probably end up inside of one of those scanners. Also, it's important to ask people, you know, are they vets, that sort of thing? Some people have shrapnel from war. You know, they don't even think about it 20, 30 years ago, or maybe recently. You have to think about that as a risk for MRI. And you also have to think, some of the older orthoprostheses, uh, artificial joints, they're not compatible with the MRIs. So the other thing you think about is MRI imaging usually takes a long time. I've seen it take as little as uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes patients are gone for like three hours when you're getting imaging from the emergency department. So you don't want to send somebody there that you don't think it's going to be stable for the next three hours, right? Because they're going to be pretty much alone in there. Uh, imaging that you can do. Patients with anxiety or claustrophobia, try to medicate them safely so that they can get through the scan. 
Things like Haldol or Ativan are all useful medications for that. Some orthoprostheses, especially the newer ones, are good. How can you figure out if it's safe to use? Just call the surgeon or the surgeon's colleagues or look in the medical records. And usually you can figure out, we usually here we're able to figure out, if they're safe to go to MRI. So let's talk about the big question. What do you use when? And this is kind of a fun lecture to do at the end of the day, because it's like a summary of everything you guys learned, but in the emergency medicine context, where we're trying to take people from the jaws of death and give them a little more time. All right, abdominal pain. Abdominal pain. That's such a big subject, but we're going to go through it. If they're greater than 60 years old, what should you do if you've got a patient who's got pretty significant abdominal pain? CT. One of my attendings back in residency used to say that the end of my career existed inside the unscanned belly of an elderly person that came in with belly pain. And I think that they were right. It's amazing how many people come in with mild to moderate pain when they're older than 60 years old. They ended up having very severe pathologies, especially here at Methodist. So I would encourage you, just get the CT scan with IV contrast if, if you can. What if there's rebound or guarding? What should you get? Yeah, good, same thing. These aren't trick questions. Some of them, <laughs> at least not yet. But you know, that's the right answer. If it looks like a surgical belly, it probably is. What about epigastric pain? So let's say a patient comes in and their pain is only, and I mean only, right in the middle here, okay? In the belly only, not in the chest, not in the left side of the belly or the right, just up in the middle. What imaging would you want to get in the emergency department? I'm hearing different answers. There's ultrasound, or chest x-ray. Some people say CAT scan. Well, you know, you're, in that area, if we're really being isolated to it, it's GERD, gastritis, and ulcerative disease in most patients, right? And you don't necessarily have to do emergency imaging. We'll talk about it if it lingers a little bit on the left or right side, but you don't necessarily have to. If you're worried about perforation in the epigastrum, which is sort of the big thing that you'd worry about that would be dangerous there, because CAT scans don't see those things, right? Not very well, very unusual. You can get a CT scan with IV contrast, or you can get an upright abdo a chest x-ray if they're not stable enough to go to CT, OK? So those are both viable things that you can do. You can see a perforation there. Actually, a chest x-ray, did you guys know this? If you could get an upright abdominal x-ray, an upright chest x-ray to look for perforation, which would you choose? Chest x-ray. Good job. It's much better. Uh, and CT is better than both. So person's pretty healthy, just has some epigastric pain. You don't necessarily have to scan them. They probably need to go to GI to get an endoscopy. But if the patient has epigastric pain, and you're kind of worried about perforation, maybe they had recent surgery, maybe they've got a history of diverticulitis, you just, maybe the pain is going to the left or the right also, get a CAT scan. Now let's talk about the right upper quadrant specifically. Let's say somebody has pain in the right upper quadrant. What is the, just there, what is the scan of choice? I heard CT and ultrasound, and the answer is actually ultrasound, sort of the gallbladder specifically. You can see on ultrasound, you can see gallstones much easier than you can on CAT scan because they shadow, like you can see on the right. It's very hard to see those on, uh, these, are, these are plain films here, but it's hard to see them on the plain films. It's also hard to see them on the CAT scan. Um, it's more sensitive and specific for the CT abdomen and pelvis and rivals it also for cholecystitis. I actually had a patient the other night, we were looking, they had generalized belly pain and they came back with a CAT scan positive for cholecystitis and the surgeon said, this was two nights ago, he said, they said, yeah, 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 but what does the ultrasound show? Right? So, All right, left upper quadrant. There's a big hint here. What imaging do you get if they have isolated pain in the left upper quadrant? It, this is the trick question. <laughs> this is the trick question. Get a lipase, because you're looking for pancreatitis. If they don't have the pain going across to the right-hand side, it's very unlikely to be gallstone pancreatitis. If you have a... Big suspicion for that, you can also get the ultrasound of the right upper quadrant, but you don't necessarily have to. It's within the standard of care to just get the lipase. What about the right lower quadrant? This is where it gets complicated, okay? This is complicated. 
could be appendicitis. What else could it be? Obstruction, perforation, a whole bunch of things. Abscess, diverticulitis, iliac, so many things. All right. What if they're less than 18 years old? What should you do? There's a hint on the page. You get a CBC and use the Alvarado score. It's this score that's on MD Calc, validated score, where you ask the kids some questions about where the pain is and how it's getting worse or better, and you use the CBC. If their score is one to three, you don't get any imaging. And they don't have appendicitis. If it's four to six, you get an ultrasound to look for the appendix. And if it's greater than six, you don't do imaging. It's almost certainly an appy, and you call general surgery now. That's where that app comes in handy. You can just ask a few questions, get a blood test, and you can actually avoid hours of waiting for an ultrasound. So the previous place that I was at, this was the standard of care for children, because we took care of a lot of kids, for children with appendicitis, or we're trying to rule it out. Now, if they're greater than 18 years old, ultrasound is not good enough. It's not good enough. So in that case, you get the CT. Good job. All right. Now, if it, it's in the right lower quadrant, and they're greater than 13 years old, and they're menstruating, you have to get the ultrasounds of the genital urinary organs, right? The ovaries, to make sure that there isn't any evidence of ovarian torsion. So you want to get a transabdominal ultrasound of the pelvis, at least, and an endovaginal ultrasound if they're not virginal. So if they're in this middle range, 13 to 17 years old, and their Alvarado score is 4 to 6, you'd get an ultrasound of the appendix, and you'd get an ultrasound of the pelvis also, OK? But not necessarily a CAT scan, unless they looked really, really sick. If they're greater than 18 years old, and they're a female with pain in that area, you'd get the ultrasounds of the pelvis, and you'd get a CAT scan to rule out the appendicitis. There you go. Left lower quadrant. OK. What do we really worry about a lot in the left lower quadrant? Good. Diverticulitis and cancer and obstruction and colitis, proctitis. So if they're less than 40 years old and the pain isn't severe, it's, it's less likely that they're going to actually have something like diverticulitis. In that case, you could choose to do an observation with serial abdominal exams, watch them over three to four hours, see if they look pretty stable and don't need the CAT scan because they are a little risky. Or you could just get the CAT scan with IV contrast. People do different things. If they have this pain and they're greater than 40 years old, these are rough. People have different ages that they do the cutoff on. I'm just picking one, but 40 is a, one a lot of people agree on. You can just do the CAT scan, OK? If they really have this left lower quadrant pain, because diverticulitis after the age of 40 and especially 50 gets pretty common, especially in men. OK. If the pain is severe for any patient, just get the CAT scan. If you've really, really, really got a high suspicion that something really bad is going down, you can always just get the CAT scan. What if they've got general pain everywhere, and they're less than 60 years old, but there's no rebound, there's no guarding, they just have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. It's been going on for two days. What should you do? Stool sample's a good idea. I'm hearing about labs, stool samples. Consider not getting any imaging. Almost certainly this is food poisoning, acute gastroenteritis, or colitis. No need to subject the patient to the risk of kidney failure or radiation if it's controllable pain and things are looking good after first round of medications. What if you've got a patient with ascites? You do an ultrasound of the abdomen, and you can do a safe paracentesis, right? So they've got belly pain. You want to roll out spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So you get an ultrasound, and you, you, uh, when they do the ultrasounds and you do a paracentesis, ha are you, have you guys been trained in doing paracentesis? Any of you guys in your programs? Some people. OK. You aim for the dark stuff, and you pull it out. And you don't touch the white stuff. <laughs> Honest to goodness, that's 50% of knowing how to do a paracentesis right there. All right. But the, the key thing is that you order the ultrasound of the abdomen that will get you the paracentesis with ultrasound in whatever way your institution does it. What if you've got flank pain, very lateral pain, pain that migrates from the flank to the lower quadrants? Kidney stones. Kidney stones, right, especially this pain that 
comes and goes and no position is quite comfortable, get a CAT scan. Get it non-contrast. Get it as a renal protocol if you can. Because the advantage of the renal protocol CTs is not only do they not have the contrast, they actually take fewer slices further apart. And by doing so, they reduce the radiation too. Okay? In fact, the radiation from the x-ray, two x-rays of the abdomen is about the same as a renal stone protocol in most institutions. In trauma, in trauma, what do you guys get for the belly? Fast, good job, fast exam. Usually that'll be done by an attending. Uh, perhaps in the future, mid-levels will be more involved in doing those at other locations as well. If it's positive, what do you do with the patient? Surgery. Surgery, that's right. You just send them. If it's negative, consider a CT. If they really have a lot of pain, or you can watch and wait, you can observe them. Uh, it, it depends on how much pain they're in and their vital signs and all the rest. Okay, but the, great, the big lesson from this slide is if there's a FAST exam that's positive, you send them to the OR and use the FAST immediately because you can do it while you're getting everything ready for CAT scan. Abdominal pain, what not to order? What's this? It's an x-ray of the belly, right? <laughs> that's it. I can't really tell you much more. There's some gas in there. This looks like, doctor, like a nonspecific uh, bowel gas pattern. You know, I'd recommend a CT scan if your threshold is high enough, right? Isn't that what the reads always say? It's less sensitive and less specific than a CAT scan. I'm gonna, this is a personal opinion situation here. So now I'm giving personal opinion. Two views radiation for the abdomen, two view x-ray of the belly. It's the same as that CT renal. So it's kind of a lot of radiation for an x-ray. And it doesn't see as much, actually, as the CT renal does. So if you have somebody who's got belly pain, and you say, I'm going to get the CAT scan first, and it's negative, and they've got belly pain still, what do you do? You get the x-ray first, excuse me. The x-ray's negative. They still got some pain. Now you're going to get a CT. That's right. What if it's positive? What if the abdominal x-ray is positive for a small bowel obstruction? What's surgery going to ask for? They're going to ask for a CT scan. Right? Because they want to see exactly where the transition point is, things like this. So why are we doing an abdominal x-ray if you're always going to end up getting this CT? If all roads lead to Rome. Let's start with the least. Right. Although well, here's what I would say. You're saying start with the least expensive. An abdominal x-ray plus a CAT scan is more expensive than just a CAT scan, though. So that's kind of, that's just, again, this is personal opinion, but that's sort of what I would, the way I'd look at it. Because I generally find in the end, it's hard to rule something out with just the x-ray, and it's hard to rule something in sufficient for surgery to be satisfied. Depends on your institution. Abdominal x-ray or KUB, there are exceptions where everybody's going to agree you should do it. Checking for NG placement, foreign body, patient's not stable enough for CAT scan, then of course, get the x-ray. Get what you can. Uh, oral contrast, why use it? Some radiology patients, uh, departments prefer it. Um, uh, patients who are allergic to the... Uh, IV contrast probably aren't allergic to oral, actually, in more recent studies that have been done. Um, so it's a bit institution specific. If your radiology department wants you to use it, then use it. Um, others say don't use it because it's not usually necessary with the new CAT scans. You can see pretty much as well with the IV contrast without the oral. Um, and you know, you've got these patients with surgical issues. You're getting them a CAT scan to rule out a surgical issue. You're telling them to stay in PO and then drink this big bottle of fluid. A little bit difficult. Uh, it can take longer, and it can make patients who are vomiting vomit more. So there's some risks with it, too. Chest pain. What do you order on all chest pain patients? Good job. Nicely done. <laughs> when do you look for a PE, though? Which patients do you look for a PE in? What's that? Shorter breath? Tachycardic? Hyperventilation? So how many things do they have to have before you'll order it? What's your threshold? It's going to vary, right? People have different thresholds. Let me suggest one way of looking at it. MD Calc is going to help you here, too. So some patients, I would say, you can actually rule out by history and physical. Some patients can be ruled out by a lab test, and some patients can be ruled out or in by imaging. So there's this rule called the PERC rule. Okay, and it has to do with some of their vital signs and the history. The modified PERC rule. Um, I was one of the co-authors on that. 
the P is extremely unlikely, and it's on MD calc, if they're perk negative. You ask them all these questions and they're negative, then they almost certainly do not have a pulmonary embolism. You don't have to order a D dimer, you don't have to order a CAT scan. Isn't that great? So I would look it up. Too many things to go over here to go through each little scale, but look it up on MD Calc. If it's negative, you've effectively, to the standard of care, ruled out PE. You don't need labs, don't need imaging. If the modified PERC is positive, then you need to get a D dimer. Okay? So you order a D dimer in the cases where the patients are positive to those questions. All right. And just remember that the positive in pregnancy for a D dimer is higher than the positive for a regular uh, patient who is not pregnant, and there are scales that exist. You can look them up online. If the D dimer is positive, does that mean the patient has a PE? No. no. Most people have a positive D dimer, actually. You, most of you have a positive D dimer. It doesn't mean anything. A negative one means they don't have a PE. But a positive one and no renal failure, then you consider getting the CAT scan PE protocol. This is a saddle embolus on this CT. If the D-dimer is positive and renal failure is present, what other options do you have? VQ scan. VQ scan, good, that's on the left. If there's no lung disease, they don't have a history of COPD, and no lung scarring, no atelectasis, you can use it. If they do, you can't, not very well. If there's lung disease, consider getting an MRA if the creatinine clearance is greater than 30 on their, you know, the GFR, okay? So you've got to look in the lab results to see that one. What if they're D-dimer positive, they've got COPD, and they've got renal failure, they're not on dialysis, then you could consider getting an ultrasound. Because at that point, what are you going to do? No matter what you choose, it's going to be a bad choice for the patient. So the standard of care is that you can actually get an ultrasound of the lower extremities, and if you've got a high enough clinical suspicion, it really looks like a PE, you do the ultrasound, you find a DVT, then you can say that they've got a PE in that case. That is acceptable. Okay? And if they're hypotensive, unstable, and your CAT scan's really close, you can consider getting a CT PE, even if they've got renal failure, to save their life if they're hypotensive, because TPA reduces the mortality rate by about 50%, okay? which is huge. What if the chest pain patient is this, is this? Severe, acute, tearing, ripping. They've got oliguria. There's hematuria in what little urine they make. They've had syncope. They've also got a history of Marfan's. <laughs> Different BP in each arm. They can't move their legs, and there's pleural effusions on exam and on x-ray. What is this? It's an aortic dissection, right? That's what the books say. Uh-oh. It's possibly an aortic dissection. But they actually did really good studies where they looked at everybody that sort of fit this picture. So they found that the risk of a CTA in these patients, this is controversial, but true in the literature, exceeds likely benefit. The math is this. In those patients who are positive for everything, only about one in a thousand are actually positive for a dissection. OK? One in a thousand. It'll vary by institution, but that's roughly where it is. One in 300 patients will eventually 10 or 20 years down the line, die of renal failure if you give them the CAT scan. So you risk harming 3.3 people for every one positive you get. And that doesn't even say how many you're going to save, right? So this is a tricky situation where the academic literature says, don't scan. And I'll tell you that in most circumstances, clinically, most of us scan because people are afraid to miss it. So you have to really. Think about the ethical situation here and decide where you're going to make a decision, but whether you scan or not in these situations with your attending. It's a hard one, because it's easy to say do no harm, and this is where it's hard to apply it in practice. All right. You can also get an MRI of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis if they're stable enough, which may or may not be the case. You can also do an ultrasound for AAA. It's not the same thing, but sometimes it'll get them to the OR to get things looked at in a way that they can evaluate for dissection, too. Dyspnea, just get a chest x-ray. That's easy. Unless they're only wheezing, then you actually don't have to get a chest x-ray, especially if they're younger. So trauma, dyspnea, you can get a chest x-ray, look for the pneumothorax. Anybody see pneumothorax on here? There's one on the left. It's hard to see on these things, but you see there's lungs markings on the right, but not on the left? Good. And then EFAS to the chest. You ever seen these? Did you see these today? 
No? Oh, this is cool. Take a look. Do you see those little lines on the left? Somebody put a probe on somebody's chest. Okay, a linear probe. And if you see those lines, there's no pneumothorax there. Isn't that neat? And if the lines are absent, if you don't see that little squiggly line thing, then they have a pneumothorax. And it's actually just as good as the chest x-rays. So you can use an ultrasound if you can't get an x-ray to do it. Something to think about. Pain in the limb. Get the x-ray of the affected area and consider imaging one space above and below. Elbow pain, for example. Oh my gosh, look at this. Don't get distracted by the obvious injury. Consider getting a humerus and forearm x-ray as well. Maybe they've got a distal radius fracture or something. They often go together, especially when something is strong enough to do that. <laughs> Rio! So this happened in Rio to a poor French gymnast. If it hurts after trauma in the limbs, the rule is, doesn't even have to look like that, get an x-ray. <laughs> All right, except the Ottawa rules. Have you heard of the Ottawa rules? Yes, all of you? Oh, cool, another MD calc thing you can use. Invented by other people, MD calc just consolidates these things. The Ottawa rules tell you if you actually have to get an x-ray of the ankle or the foot, in patients who have pain there. It depends on where the pain is located. So look them up. Simple thing, takes about a minute to look up, one minute to do the exam, and you can actually avoid doing an x-ray on some patients, saving you and the patient time, and improving customer satisfaction scores. <laughs> if they're happy with that, you gotta sort of explain why you're not getting the x-ray. Uh, wrist pain. One pet peeve we have in emergency medicine a lot is when people have pain at the snuff box. Do you know what the snuff box is? Right here, good job, exactly, you're totally right. It's right where, you see these little tendons here? See where you got a little hole in between them, right? If it hurts there, bottom of the thumb rough area on your scaphoid, then you need to get a four view of the wrist when they fall, not just a three view. It rules out a scaphoid fracture. I will order four views and get a three view back. You gotta tell them to go back and do the one extra view. The reason is, if you look on the left, the scaphoid the scaphoid is this bone right here, okay? See all the overlap? It's hard to see what the outline of that bone is. But if you look at the opposite side on the left, it's very easy, see where it says S? To see the outline of the bone. And that's important because if that bone is broken, you can get pain for the rest of your life because the bone can die quite easily. That bone is just really fragile. So you get a four view if they've got pain at the snuff box. Let's say it's seven days later. They got x-rays a week ago. They were negative right after the fall. What should you do? Good job. Get them again. Because sometimes the calcium will come in there and you can see them at that point. What if they can't walk on that knee you just x-rayed? Get a CAT scan. Maybe you missed a tibial plateau fracture. Consider an outpatient MRI. What if they've got trauma to the pelvis or they got some hip pain? You can get an x-ray. Totally good. If they can't walk after that, what should you do? Get a CAT scan. I've had uh, one case where I had a completely normal x-ray. They were fine. Came back a week later, the pain just kept getting worse. We got a CAT scan, there was a fracture there on the CAT scan, but you couldn't see it on the x-ray. So it's very important if they can't walk, that patient could walk, but, and they, they had no pain when they left, but if they can't walk, get a CAT scan. Go to the higher level. Uh, trauma, falls for more than 10 feet. Landed on their feet, okay? No pain, I would still get an x-ray of the calcanea on both feet, the heels, and consider getting a lumbar CT. Why? You get this transfer of force up through the spine and they can be distracted by pain in one location or the other, not even know it. I've seen people not even know it and they had major injuries in both locations. I was in a high-speed MVA but I was in my truck. It was all okay. I don't have any pain after, I'm doing all right. Maybe get a chest x-ray and a pelvic x-ray. Sometimes patients seem like they're with it and they're not. I, you got a high speed MVA, just do that. Peds versus auto, this patient's to be hit by a car, it's a real picture. They said they're fine, they can walk, they're doing fine. Maybe get a chest x-ray in it, just at least something. And of course, x-ray of anything that hurts. Doc, I got this pain, it's chronic, it's in my back. I fell eh, a few years ago. It follows this path down to my mid-calf. 
I'd like this medication here. <laughs> Don't image him. Don't give him that medicine either. At least not if I'm on. Back pain. It's acute and lateral, but it's not at the flanks. So, I, you know, I was lifting something up, and it hurts on my right side, right? A little bit. But it's not at the flank. It's kind of below that sort of lateral lumbar. Nothing in midline. You don't need imaging. If it's acute in that, the flanks, then you get the picture of the kidneys. Good. Good. So back pain, trauma, another thing. If it's acute midline, get a CAT scan. The two images on the left, those are CAT scan images that you can get today. The one on the right is the x-ray. Which one can you see more with? CT, easier to see things. It catches more things. Which one is more radiation? They have the same radiation, roughly. Ooh. <laughs> CT is more expensive, but same radiation. So maybe don't get. Consider, don't getting x-rays of the spine. Same radiation as a CAT scan, roughly, but they're not as sensitive and specific. They miss more things. Take the same amount of time. Head trauma. CT of the head. And? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe get a CT of the C-spine first, and you can consider the MRI. Remember the nexus rule. Put on a hard collar if they have any midline neck pain after trauma, or they're altered at all, drinking, on drugs, on cush. And remember this, never diagnose a cervical fracture with a patient that lacks a picture of a cervical, of a hard collar in the image that you picked to do it with. In other words, don't send them to CAT scan, diagnose a C1 fracture, and have the radiologist also note the absence of a hard collar in the CAT scan. Not very good way to go. Put a hard collar on first. Uh, trauma in kids, there's this rule called PCARN, won't go into it, but basically, based on the age mechanism and focal neurologic findings, you can tell whether to do a head CT or just watch the kid for a few hours after they fall. Okay? That's a great rule because it can minimize the amount of radiation these kids get and their risk of brain tumors is much higher. If they're less than 50 years old and they've got no focal neurologic abnormalities on exam, you don't need a head CT for syncope, necessarily. Okay? So if you've got a relatively low suspicion for an intracranial thing, you don't have to get the CT if they're less than 50 years old by the San Francisco guidelines. Okay? If they're older than that, then, or they've got focal neurologic findings, of course, get the CAT scan if they pass out. If they have syncope and they're greater than 50. Uh, headache. No neurologic findings. No imaging is necessary if they've had headaches before. If this is sort of typical of old headaches, even if it's worse than usual, you don't necessarily have to get a CAT scan of the head, especially in a young person. If they have focal findings, please do. If they look like this, <laughs> and they never looked like this before, consider the head CT. Then the stroke workup, possibly, if their eyes are tonically deviated to the left. <laughs> or maybe an LP. Seizure, if it's the first for a patient and they're not between six months and five years old with a fever, Maybe get a CT of the head, EEG, MRIs. What if they've had prior seizures and they come in, they come in, they've got a mask on, you know, and, but they've got no head trauma, somebody caught them before they fell. You don't need imaging. People have, check a blood sugar and maybe send them on their way if you can get a really clear story about how everything happened. The tough thing that happens to a lot of seizure patients is that they get a billion CAT scans in their lives while they're post-ictal. You know? And they have seizures. They can end up having, you know, dozens of CAT scans in their life that they really didn't need because they've already had that workup. And it's a known syndrome they get from time to time. Altered mental status. Don't forget the chest x ray. Head CT is easy to remember, but chest x ray, pneumonia, big cause of it. You may not hear it on exam. Uh, focal neurologic signs, asymmetric weakness, immediate head CT, and then. MRI of the brain after that, and if it's less than four hours, four and a half hours ago, consider CTAs, even if they've got some renal issues to look for stroke, because of the whole stroke guideline thing. Greater than four and a half hours, MRI of, MRI of the head and neck, because 
you don't need to subject them to necessarily the same risk of contrast. You can probably do the MRIs if you've got time and they're out of the TPA window. That's TPA, by the way, on the left. What if they got vertigo? This is one of those tough situations. Patient's got vertigo. Is it nothing or is it a stroke? Is it nothing or is it that brain tumor that's going to shut off their circulatory system? Well, great thing is there's this thing called the HINTS exam. I just have you guys Google it. You do three maneuvers on physical exam, and if they're all normal, they're really easy to do, and they're all normal, it is more sensitive than an MRI for finding stroke in a patient. So if they're all normal, you don't have to do an MRI or any head imaging for vertigo. So good thing to look up. If it's positive, then you got to do the stroke workup. Bilateral weakness, get a good neuro exam, strength, sensation, and that rectal. Bilateral weakness, of course, you got to consider MRIs of the spine. If it's in the legs, you may start with the lumbar spine and then do the CT, uh, the MRI of the C and T spine. If it's arm normal in the arms, maybe just the C and T spine. And that's about it. That's our quick run through of most of the situations you'll ever run through in emergency medicine where you need to make a choice about what to do. I'll see if they can send these slides out to you all so that you can have the list. And that's about it. Go find it.